then the next case to come before the court is Cartwright versus Akron General Medical Center. And uh, the appellant will have 15 minutes to um, present their argument, and you may reserve up to five minutes if you choose. You just have to let me know, and I'll keep the time. And then, uh, since there are two of you, I'm sure you know that you have to split your time. Thank you. All right. When you're ready, we're ready to listen. All right. Thank you, Your Honors. All right. May it please the court, I'm Danielle Kulik on behalf of Erin Cartwright. Uh, I would like to reserve the five minutes for rebuttal. Uh, this case was a medical malpractice that was dismissed on summary judgment. The, the main issue here is whether or not Mr. Cartwright knew or should have known about uh, the injury at the date uh, the defendants claim or at the date that the plaintiff claims. My whole argument stems from the extra report that shows that Erin Cartwright was given his discharge papers on June 11, 2014 with his new diagnosis. Uh, so my feeling is he didn't know while he was in the hospital, he didn't know before he went in the hospital, he knew when he got the diagnosis. And that's when I cited um, the Wakem versus Cleveland case. When he got the diagnosis that something else was wrong is when he was aware there was malpractice. But that's not a, a bright line rule or anything. It isn't a bright line rule, but I, I think for summary judgment, they needed to prove that their date was the correct date. I think reasonable minds could come to more than one conclusion. So I feel if a jury had decided this, that their date was correct or my date was correct, I wouldn't be here in front of you, but a jury didn't decide it. They, the court decided it on summary, and I think there were more facts for a jury to consider. So that's, that's where I kind of come to my issue there. Counsel, do you take any issue with the date your client terminated the doctor-patient relationship with Dr. Brooks? No, I, I agree that that's when he terminated the relationship, but I'm just stating that terminating the relationship just meant he he wanted to seek other doctors' opinions. It didn't mean that he knew so, there was medical malpractice. He might have just not liked Dr. Bro. He may have just not liked that hospital. There are many reasons somebody discontinues treatment. Until he became aware there was an issue, though, we can't say that he, he was out of statute of limitations time. But, but, the, <clears throat> but in this record, didn't he indicate that one of the reasons, at least one of the reasons that he terminated the relationship was because he thought he had done some things wrong? Correct. Yeah, he says, his quote was, we discussed things I thought he didn't do right. So that's when he went back to sort of discuss with him, I'm not sure if things went right. What do you think, Dr. Bro? And Dr. Bro didn't come right out on that day and say, yeah, you're right. I did malpractice. You're injured. No, on that day, he thought something was wrong, but he wasn't sure. So he went to get a second opinion. And then it was during that second opinion that he got his new diagnosis. And it was then that he was aware. I mean, if Dr. Burrow would have told him back then, yeah, I did something wrong, we would be in a different situation. My, my claim is that the expert report shows on June 11th he was handed his new diagnosis. And then the second part of this claim comes from um, whether or not Dr. Burrow was an independent contractor. And for me, at least, that was never part of the record. That was never even an idea um, for the agency estoppel. He was not an independent contractor. There's no affidavit stating that he was, and he never told Mr. Cartwright that he was. So I feel the arguments there, you know, stole for themselves. And thank you. You know, I'm going to ask you a question. I saw it. <laughs> you're, I wasn't very subtle. You're saying independent contractor, and I read it in your brief, yes. independent contractor. But as I read your reply brief, I think at least twice, you said Dr. Brown was an employee of Akron General. Yes. Which way are you going? Those are two right. separate, those are two distinct legal... Exactly, and that's my argument. My argument is he's an employee. He is not an independent contractor. When I read their appellee brief, and excuse me if I read it wrong, but I thought their appellee brief was saying he was an independent contractor. So that's why I'm coming around saying there is no agency estoppel, there's no independent contract. He's an employee. We have to look at this from the employee employer standpoint. We have to look at this from respondent superior, not agency estoppel, because he is not an independent contractor. So you're saying he's an employee? He's an employee, 100 percent. And I don't know if you saw anything different in the record. When I was litigating this case before a summary judgment, it never occurred to me that they were even going to propose he was an independent contractor, because that, that idea never came up in the trial court. Is there something in the record in, in depositions that would indicate that Dr. Burrow was an employee of Cleveland Clinic after general? I would have to double check what Dr. Burrow said exactly, but I, I believe that the 
the evidence has to show he made somebody aware that he was an independent contractor. Contractor, so it starts that he is an employee you just unless said he proves an otherwise. Contract. Right, he is an employee unless he proves otherwise. So I don't think there's anything in the record, or there may be in his deposition, to affirmatively prove he was an employee. But he starts as an employee of Akron General unless he proves otherwise. So he is an employee until he says otherwise. And so I'm saying the record might not reflect him saying yes, I'm an employee, but it doesn't reflect him saying otherwise. And that's the key for this: is that he's an employee until he says otherwise. And I, I believe it was. So you're saying whenever they filed their motion for summary judgment, they didn't affirmatively demonstrate that he was an independent contractor. Exactly. Yes, there was no proof that he was an independent contractor. And then there was, in the case law, it shows that not only does he have to say he's an independent contractor for the, but for them to prove that, he had to tell Mr. Cartwright. We have to show Mr. Cartwright knew. We have to. They have to show a lot of items that they didn't show in their summary judgment. So the granting of their summary judgment, I thought, was premature. Why couldn't Dr. Grove just have been working for himself? Because he was, the hospital, Akron General, was where this surgery was. He could have been working for himself, but he needed to state that to Mr. Cartwright. That's what all the case law shows is if he was working for himself, he needed to show Mr. Cartwright that this is, Akron General is just a citus. They have nothing to do with this. You're, you're doing this surgery with me. Akron General is just a building. And there is no proof that he ever said that, or that Mr. Cartwright ever knew that, or that that was even part of the record. You know, they're saying it on appeal, but Akron General was not a citus. Akron General was the hospital that Mr. Cartwright chose. And yes, he was directed to Dr. Bro, but they have no proof in their summary judgment that they would have needed to show that Cartwright didn't consider the fact that he worked for Akron General, the fact that Akron General is such a well-known hospital, all of those things. If Dr. Bro, you know, for instance, worked for you know mom and pop's hospital on the corner street, we don't know if Mr. Cartwright still would have gone there. Akron General is such a popular name, and Mr. Cartwright never said in his <clears throat> deposition, "Yeah, I chose Dr. Bro. I didn't care where he worked." So that's that's my main point. Is summary judgment has such a high threshold, and I feel like they didn't prove their facts that they needed. I think a jury still needed to look at this and decide this. I have just one more question. Yes. I know you disagree with the yes. court's rationale about the statute of limitations. Do you agree with the court's rationale that if they were, if the court was correct about the statute of limitations, then your second claim must fail by law, or do you disagree with that? I disagree with that as well, because I believe that my second claim, we could have gone after Akron General without going after Dr. Bro. Okay. And I think that's in there, so yes, I, I disagree. If there are no more questions, I will allow there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, on behalf of Dr. Bro, I'm going to use 10 minutes, and then Mr. Potenza, on behalf of Akron General, will be using five minutes. Thank you. May it please the court, my name is Doug Leak, and I'm here on behalf of the defendant appellee, Dr. Todd Bro. And on behalf of Dr. Bro, we ask that you affirm the trial court order granting him summary judgment. The basis for granting summary judgment is that the plaintiff's medical negligence action was untimely filed under revised code 2305.113A within one year of the cognizable event. Revised code 2305.113A governs the one-year statute of limitations and the commencement of a medical negligence action. And under this rule, there are two dates that are important upon which a case must be commenced. It's the later of either what's called the discovery rule, when the patient discovered or should have discovered a resulting injury, or the other rule, the termination rule, when the physician-patient relationship was terminated. In this case, there is no doubt that June 2nd, 2014 was the cognizable event. And as the Ohio Supreme Court in Freisinger v. Leach held, the cognizable event is that noteworthy event that puts a reasonable person on notice that an injury is related to some medical care or treatment. And the facts are clear that this, both, we have a unique case, that the discovery rule and the termination date both happened on June 2nd, 2014. And the facts that have been established are through the deposition testimony of the plaintiff himself. 
we have on June 2nd, 2014, where he goes to the hospital with blood in his urine and abdominal pain. This required hospitalization, so we have the resulting injury. Also on that day, by his own admission, a radiologist told him that the lock on the Jackson Pratt drain, which is the subject of this action, was the lock was not removed. Also on June 2nd, in conversations between the plaintiff and Dr. Bro, the plaintiff actually told Dr. Bro that he had some concerns that the Jackson Pratt drain was not properly removed. So on June 2nd, 2014, the plaintiff admitted that he made an association between his resulting injury and the removal of the Jackson Pratt drain. And we also know that he terminated the relationship for these concerns. So we have both the discovery rule, he was on notice that this injury that he presented to the hospital was related to the removal of the Jackson Pratt drain, and simultaneously terminated the physician-patient relationship. What I'd like to address is the plaintiff's um, response, that they believe that the date is either the date of discharge, June 11, 2014, or sometime before the filing of the action. The only thing the plaintiff relies upon to establish a date after June 2, 2014, is paragraph 7 of his complaint, where they allege, where he alleges that he learned of the malpractice on a date between June 11, 2014, and before the filing of the complaint. They do not specify what date. They give a range, June 11, to the, any time before the filing of the complaint. That is not sufficient. But more importantly, the standard upon which the plaintiff relies, that it was the time that he was aware of malpractice, is not the standard for the cognizable event. And as the Ohio Supreme Court in Flowers versus Walker addressed, it's not when you are told of malpractice, it's that cognizable event of the noteworthy event in which the, the reasonable person is on notice that the condition is related to a medical treatment or care. And under the Flowers case, the Ohio Supreme Court held that constructive knowledge and not the legal significance of the facts is what governs here. And so what we have on June 2nd, 2014 is not only constructive knowledge, but we actually have actual knowledge on the part of the plaintiff that he believed something wrong happened. And so no doubt, there's no genuine issue material fact that June 2nd, 2014 is that date under the discovery rule and the termination rule. And so they had until June 2nd, 2015 to file this action, but did not file it until nine days later on June 11th, 2015, untimely as the trial court fully explained in its order. And with respect to the case law upon which the plaintiff relies, that case law actually supports our position here. More specifically, the, the Joaquin versus Cleveland Clinic case, an Eighth District Court of Appeals case, is directly on point here. In that case, the plaintiff was discharged from the hospital from a, a procedure on September 28th of 2006. Shortly thereafter, on October 6th, I'm sorry, October 10th, 2006, the plaintiff returned to the hospital based upon symptoms. And the Eighth District Court of Appeal found that the cognizable event was that moment that the patient returned to the hospital with those symptoms. Not when the patient learned later of malpractice. It was when those symptoms made that patient go back to the hospital. Those facts are virtually identical here because we have the removal of the Jackson Pratt drain, symptoms afterwards, blood in the urine, abdominal pain, that required the plaintiff to go to the hospital on June 2nd, 2014. So that cognizable event is when, that, when the plaintiff walked into the hospital on June 2nd, 2014 with those symptoms, being told by a radiologist that, some, that the lock was not removed, the discussions with Dr. Bro telling Dr. Bro that he thought something was wrong, the association between the symptoms and what he believed was done wrong, and then most importantly, termination of 
that relationship based upon all that with Dr. Bro. So under the discovery rule and the termination rule, we have June 2nd, 2014, and as a result, the filing of their complaint, as the trial court properly noted, was untimely. And based upon that, we ask that you affirm the trial court judgment, a summary judgment for Dr. Bro. Thank you. Thank you. Just in case I take more than what, five minutes. Whatever amount is left. <clears throat> Counsel, may it please the court. Uh, my name is Rocco Pertens, and I have the privilege of representing Akron General in this matter. Um, I want to start by following up on uh, Mr. Leake's argument. Um, what plaintiff proposed to the court was a rule of the cognizable event that has never been decided, never been ruled upon anywhere in the state of Ohio. The cases have been replete, including the Flowers case, that says you don't have to be told you're a victim of malpractice. You don't have to have an expert who tells you that you're a victim of malpractice. What you need is something that alerts a person that there may have been something done wrong. And that's exactly what happened here. Flowers states uh, it's constructive knowledge of facts rather than actual knowledge of their legal significance. Um, and that's enough to start the, the statute of limitations running under the discovery rule. A plaintiff need not have discovered all the relevant facts necessary to file a claim in order to trigger the statute of limitations. Rather, it's the cognizable event itself that puts the, the patient on notice. And that's clear here. There really is no dispute. He had, first of all, um, the issue of the malpractice is alleged solely against Dr. Bro, and that he did that in his office. That's going to be important later when we talk about independent contractor and employee. But um, <clears throat> this gentleman had this drain removed in the office the week before his hospitalization. He had significant pain that caused him to go to the hospital. That day, June 2nd, he talks to another physician who says, I think they did this wrong. Then, the plaintiff has a conversation with Dr. Bro and tells him, I think you have done something wrong in my care. And because of that, I no longer want you to be my doctor. Both the cognizable event and the termination of the relationship occurred at that point. So it's clear that plaintiff had until June 2nd of the following year to file their claim, and they didn't do so. He didn't do so. All right. So then we come to the question of the vicarious liability claim. This is not a claim that anyone at Akron General, on the premises, even Dr. Bro, but more importantly, any other uh, individual at the hospital provided any inappropriate care. The sole claim is that Dr. Bro, in his office, provided inappropriate care. They produced an expert who came forward with a report, and that's what he said. So this happened in Dr. Bro's office. It didn't happen at the hospital. Okay, so there's two arguments that I heard. One is, under independent contractor, there's no uh, summary judgment. And number two, because he's an employee, summary judgment doesn't apply. I would point out a couple of things. First, if you look at the briefs filed by plaintiffs in this case, plaintiff in this case, there is no evidence produced with their responses to the motions for summary judgment. There's no affidavit, there's no deposition, and there's no documents at all. Plaintiff argues that Dr. Bro is an employee until proven otherwise. Well, Dr. Bro in his deposition testified that he was uh, a member of a group of urologists. He didn't testify that he was a member of Akron General. Um, there is no evidence in this record that he's an employee. The plaintiff bears the burden of proof on that issue. Except in summary judgment. In summary judgment, we, the hospital has to demonstrate that he's an independent contractor, right? I don't have to prove it. No, I 
I, I have to point. Evidence. I have to point to the record, and, and we've done that. But even okay, how did you do that? We produced uh, the deposition. I guess I, I'd have to think about that. I know Dr. Bro in his deposition talked about that. So um, even if Dr. Bro was an employee, so so I think it's conceded if he's an independent contractor, the claim fails. But now we hear the argument that he's an employee. And if he's an employee, somehow, even if summary judgment uh, is appropriate for him, for Dr. Bro, it's not appropriate for Akron General. Well, that's simply not true. A, an, a claim for uh, vicarious liability, irrespective of agency or not, is a derivative claim. Comer v. Risco address the principles applied to that setting. They talk about there being a right of indemnification. If he is entitled to summary judgment, the right of indemnification is extinguished. And based on that, uh, as one of the, the rationales, um, if the principal party cannot be held liable, the vicarious liable, liable party uh, cannot be held liable. And this specific issue was addressed in the, I think Mr. Leak pronounced it, the Joaquin decision. It was cited by a plaintiff in her brief. In the Joaquin decision, uh, that case, I think it was, was it 8th district? I thought it was maybe the 5th district. But in any event, um, the Cleveland Clinic employed the doctors in that case. Summary judgment was granted in favor of everybody based on the statute of limitations. Um, in, a, in analyzing the issues on appeal, the, the Court of Appeals agreed with the summary judgment in favor of the doctors. Plaintiff made the same argument here that because they were employees, the Cleveland Clinic doesn't get out of the case. And this, uh, the Court of Appeals, citing Comer, said no. It is a vicarious claim, it is a derivative claim. That case squarely addresses this issue. I would ask that you uh, affirm the summary judgment on behalf of Akron General. Thank you. You still have five minutes remaining. Wonderful. All right. Thank you. All right. So we have a few issues for me to address here. So I'm going to try to address them in turn. Um, the first issue that I heard them discuss was that he returned to the hospital because he was um, urinating blood, and that the, ur that the radiologist told him there might have been an issue. So where I go from there is. He knew that that may have been a side effect. He knew something's wrong and going to the hospital. That could have been a side effect. The, the doctor could have, and we don't know what Dr. Bro told him when he found urinating blood. We know what the radiologist told him. But that could be, I don't know if it's a side effect. I don't know if that's just, oh yeah, you're gonna urinate some blood for a few weeks and then it'll situate. I don't know. And I don't think that's, that should be the point where he, is, he knows. Um, I also understand what they're saying. They don't need an expert to tell my guy, you have medical malpractice. Well, we're not saying he needed an expert to tell him. We're saying that he needed that infection. And he was given his discharge papers on June 11th showing you have an infection. There was something wrong. And that's where I say Joaquin kind of shows on my side because in Joaquin, that was the date of the infection, not the date of the pain, is the date that they used. And so in my case, I want to also follow that and say the date of the infection. And he found out about the infection on June 11th. Now, the next issue I want to go to is about... Uh, the uh, agency estoppel and the independent contractor and the like. Uh, when I, I'm just reviewing briefly uh, my reply brief, so I understand that you've read this and it's all in there, but the, he's talking about an appeal, appellate court case. I cite the Supreme Court case, Lozanto versus Cruz, where it says, for the wrong of a servant acting within the scope of authority, the plaintiff has a right of action against either the master or the servant. So even if my claim fails, against uh, Dr. Bro, I could have gone against the master or the servant. I can still go for Akron General. And so if you, if you find uh, Mr. Cartwright's claims should not have been dismissed on summary judgment, and there should be uh, a jury to conclude whether Akron General did wrong or whether Dr. Bro did wrong, those issues can be decided separately. So I just wanted the court to, to be aware that that is at least how I read the law there. So. In conclusion, I feel summary judgment was improper for both Akron General and Dr. Bro, but if you find 
you know, one, you don't have to find the other as well. I feel a jury needs to look over these issues. I feel the summary judgment wasn't proven. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all the attorneys here and the